My name is Jason Fitzroy Jeffers, and I am the co-founder and board chair of Third Horizon. I would like to welcome you to the sixth edition of Third Horizon Film Festival here in Miami, Florida, ancestral home of the Tequesta, Seminole, Miccosukee, and Taino, the latter of whom po also populated several Caribbean nations, along with people such as the Kalinago, Lokono, Lakayo, and so many native peoples whose history has been lost to us. Third Horizon is a creative collective dedicated to producing and exhibiting cutting edge films and other arts of the Caribbean and their diasporas and other marginalized spaces in the global south. Thank you so much for joining us for the retrospective program, Nomadic Griot, a tribute to Sarah Maldoror. This part of the program we are exploring, um, looking back at the Negritude panel um, at 35 years old. Some of you were just here and you saw the incredible film by Sarah Maldoror about that. Um, in 1987, a historic gathering of black intellectuals convened in Miami under the rubric of negritude, the concept first espoused by the Martinican poet and thinker Aimé Césaire. Present at the negritude conference was Césaire himself, as well as the filmmaker Sarah Maldoror, whose documentary Aimé Césaire, The Mask of Words, was filmed at the event. 35 years on, Anushka de Andrade, who is here with us today, um, the daughter of Sarah Maldoror, is here um, to present this retrospective uh, throughout the weekend. And she is joining uh, Dr. Andrea Quealy, um, cultural anthropologist, uh, the award-winning curator and poet Natasha Marin, and Miami-based researcher and community archivist um, Nadej Green. Um, I'd like to read their bios. Um, but first, we'd like to thank our founding sponsor, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, for believing in the vision and mission of Third Horizon from the very beginning as well as Just Films Ford Foundation for helping us to take the organization to new heights. Uh, we also have to give a special thanks to uh, Wincote Foundation for once again um, supporting the festival. Further, this conversation wouldn't be possible without our generous partners here at the Prez Art Museum Miami, and as well as support from FIU LACC's US Department of Education t Title VI grant. Um, please allow me to introduce our panelists. Um, Anushka de Andrade is artistic director for the Amiens International, or was, correct? Was. <laughs> for the Amiens International Film Festival, a screenwriter, producer, and distributor. Um, she has simultaneously earned experience in intercultural dialogue and analysis in cultural fields that has enabled for her work, enabled her to work for the French diplomatic service as cultural attache and director of the Institut Francais in Seville, Spain and in Colombia as regional audiovisual attache for the Andean natures. She promotes her parents' legacy through the organization, the Association of Friends of Sarah Maldoror and Mario de Andrade. And I have to say her work right now, um, promoting and preserving her mother's legacy is just incredible. And we're so grateful to have Anushka here with us today. Um, Natasha Marin, am, am I pronouncing it correctly? I mean, yeah. No, no, you tell me. No. <laughs> okay. Is a conceptual artist whose projects have been recognized and acknowledged by Art Forum, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, NBC, Al Jazeera, Vice, PBS, and others. She has written the books Black Imagination 2020 and Black Powerful 2022, and her web-based project, Reparations, engaged a quarter of a million people worldwide in the practice of leveraging priv privilege and earned Marin, a mother of two, death threats by the dozens. We're so happy that you're here with us uh, today. Uh, Andrea Quealy holds positions in, in Florida International University's Department of Global and Sociocultural Studies and its African and African Diaspora Studies program. Her research interests include black and diasporic subjectivity, race and representation, intra-Caribbean migration, and the African diaspora in Latin America. She has published a book, Rescuing Our Roots, the African Anglo-Caribbean African Diaspora in Contemporary Cuba. She is currently working on an edited volume dedicated to the life and work of black Cuban filmmaker, Gloria Rolando. Thank you for joining us. And then, last but not least, our moderator and one of my favorite people in Miami, um, Nadej Green. Uh, from the sounds of it, one of your favorite people in Miami too. Uh, Nadej is a researcher, writer, and community archivist based in Miami. Her journalism has appeared on NPR, WLRN News, Marketplace, and in the Miami Herald. She's a frequent lecturer and speaker, <coughs> excuse me, 
in academic and community settings around disparities in Miami-Dade, community storytelling, local history, and race. She's the founder of Black Miami-Dade, a digital gathering space that liberates the stories and photos of black, Miami's black histories. I can't think of anyone better to lead us through this, this conversation. Nadesh, please take it away. Thank you, Jason, for your kind, kind words. Um, <laughs> I am going to jump right in. Uh, first, thank you all for being here with your beautiful selves and your glowing skin under these lights. Um, I, I just want to start off on just thoughts, reflections um, on the film that we all watched that replays what happened at the Negritude Conference um, at FIU and goes deeper still with those one-on-one -on -one interviews. And Anushka, I feel like you would be the perfect person to do the grounding on that. Uh, the creation of this work that speaks to this historical moment in Miami-Dade and really in the U.S. because this is the only time, uh, you know, the co-founders of Negritude came here in this way and it happened in Miami. Uh, what are your thoughts or just reflections on the conference that happened? Well, um I think that it was an important moment, but at that time, uh, we didn't feel it like that. It was, of course, all due to the energy and uh, the uh, volunteer of Carlos Moore who made the, that uh, uh, happen. And finally, you know, when I look at this uh, conference 35 years ago, and I am very surprised that you say that that was the only time they, they had such conference. I thought it was just an opening opportunity and things will go on. And, you know, the question is now, you said, but uh, are we uh, going back? This is a real question that we are all to have to answer, but uh, I am confident because the new generation, I feel in different field, they are fighting and I hope they will uh, take this in their arms, you know, and, and make things better. But, you know, there is a lot of things done in different fields for the fight and for our rights, but now, we have to, to do it again, and I hope through different ways uh, it will be able, for this, this, the two have us here together with this tribute to Sarah, it's also one uh, step. So it's one after the other, and we, we don't have to, to, to cry, we have to, to keep fighting, I think. That, that's the message. Uh, I hope it, we, that we have no choice, anyway. No choice. <laughs> yeah. uh, what about you, Natasha? It should be on. Is it on? Just kidding. <coughs> now? Is it on? Yes. Now it's on. <laughs> Yay. I'm the person who's like on mute during the Zoom call. <laughs> You're on mute. Um, I'm left with, uh, after seeing the films, I'm thinking about how we take care of our voices, like as curators, how we sort of tuck them in at night and make sure they have a good breakfast and lunch and dinner. Like how do we sustain our voices with love and care in the way that you and your mother have like clearly dedicated lifetimes to this work? Like, how can we take from that and continue that? Because I think it's super important that we tell our stories and that we make our own heroes and that we remember ourselves well. So that's sort of where I am, having just you know inhaled a lot of you know stimuli. Um, so I'm still I'm still processing um, in real time. But that's what I'm left with. Those are sort of reflections: is how are we going to continue to take care of ourselves and our voices? Good, e good afternoon, afternoon, right? Can everybody hear me? This, uh, speak up, speak up, that's better, yeah? yeah. Okay, great. Um, welcome, thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much for, um, for creating this space. 
Um, thank you for protecting your mother's legacy. That film, um, I had never seen it, and so I was, you know, uh, really blown away. And so I'll, I'll I'll try and be brief. So there are a couple of things that um, struck me. There's so many things that struck me, but two of the things, the beauty of it, the conversation that's happening between Martinique and, and Miami that she's creating visually is so powerful, right? The, all of those scenes, um, you know, in both spaces. And of course, um, you know, for those of you who have seen it, you know, just seen the film, Maya Angelou, reading, as you mentioned, reading Cesar in the Everglades. Um, you know, you hear the, the sound of the wind, you know, wrestling through. And, um, and so, there, it, you know, it's visually powerful. Again, I think the visual conversation that's happening between spaces that are being occupied in ways that, that really do, that honor Cesar, because the second point is the beauty of Cesar. As, you know, um, a poet, as a thinker, as somebody who's passionate, um, you know, about us, about black people, about um, the continent, about Africa, and centering himself there, and all of, all of the things that he did and the ways that he created were obviously, you know, so powerful. And so, and the way that the film represents them and, and it provides his, his voice, right, is, is, such, is also just resonating in my head, um, having just seen it. Uh, I guess I watched it last night or a couple of days ago and then I re revisited it. Um, and so, and I'll, I'll stop because again, there's so many things to talk about. But the, I couldn't believe that there was a Negritude for I had no idea before that FIU hosted a Negritude conference with Cesar and Senghor and Shoyinka and like all of these people. And you know, so that in and of itself, it, you know, take, oh, I talk about processing, I was like, how did this happen? And then I saw actually an interview of Carlos Moore and so he talked about bringing people, and he is, you know, a force, right? <laughs> and so he talked about going to France and talking to Senghor and being like, I will not take no for an answer because they were trying to come to the United States, right? So, um, so that, you know, it was also something that hopefully we can dig into and the fact of it being in Miami, okay? And so, um, and, being, and Miami being this incredible nexus of, um, blackness and language and um, and again, I get back to the visual, right, of you know, the colors of the houses, of the, you know, the, the ways that it, it, it is the uh, space in which all of these different components and um, spaces outside of the United States come together. And so, so I feel like, of course, this is a perfect place if they were gonna come to the US to actually have this conference. And then there's this other side, right? Um, so in, in the film, Cesar says, you know, I am so impressed by what's happening in the United States. You know, black people have made so much progress in the university and the schools, and you know, this is in 87. But then there's also, as he brought up, like, McDuffie. There's also, the, you know, so much of the, um, really, the commitment to um, racial segregation and inequality, right? Um, the doubling down that happens in the 80s. It, you know, there's a contrast there as well that I think is, is really, um, something that I, I really want us to reflect on and also to, to take the charge that he leads, which is, you know, how can we, um, how is this kind of, can be an opening and, and a call for us to, to move, to push forward, right? To push forward the um, justice, movement towards social justice, a movement towards, um, you know, I think he may have used the word equality, I don't remember exactly, but, but, um, but really continue you know, that legacy, you know, of negritude and, and all of the meanings of negritude, both in terms of the creatively and, you know, intellectually, politically, socially, et cetera. So I know it's not going on. No, not at all. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's funny because I discovered the negritude conference a few years ago going through FIU's uh, digital collections because I'm always digging through the academic libraries in Miami to liberate the information about black people because I don't think the only people who should have access are people with .edu emails. And I, when I saw it, I, I did a double take. I was like, wait, what? And then I started going down the list and I was like, oh my gosh. And I remember, Jason is a Facebook friend of mine. I remember like going off on a rant on Facebook. Like, did y'all know this? And everyone was like, no, like this happened in Miami. Cause I mean, and I think being a native Miami and if you're from Miami, you know how racist Miami is. And so understanding 
the history of Miami, a place that was very well incorporated by black people. Without black men, Miami would not have become a city in 1896. You needed those black men in order to have enough people to incorporate the city. And those black men were African American and Bahamian. And so even when we talk about intra-diasporic uh, connections, like Miami is the space from its very founding, right? My, Miami, Virginia Key is a maroon site, right? You have the saltwater underground railroad that comes through Miami. And so people escaping enslavement would come through Miami, through Virginia Key to the Bahamas. And so you have this history of blackness, right? That is deeply rooted, but it's also not very visible. And which is why I honor the work that you're doing, Anushka, because there is, a, it is not hard to be made invisible. And it's not that you are invisible, right? Uh, your mother's work certainly was not and still is not, but it's not hard as the world progresses for black histories to not be lost, but to be covered up. And so unearthing that and always, and insisting that it's visible, right? Insisting that this is a part of this history. It should be part of the record. It should be easy to find. You shouldn't necessarily have to pay for it. All of those ways in which I think like this conference, but in particularly the work you're doing and making sure that your mother's work is preserved is such an important part of even the idea of negritude, right? I think in the, in the film, Emi Cecilia says, negritude is struggle. And, and I thought that was really powerful. So I'll pause there and kind of talk about, or invite you all actually to talk about um, the work or how you're seeing this, the struggle um, if we're looking at a 35 year retrospective, right? How are you seeing the struggle or how are you <laughs> dealing with the struggle and what does that look like um, as, as you see it or reflect on it? Yeah, uh, but, um, my both parents were fighters and there has been strug uh, in struggle for everything, you know, just for living and and trying to, to, to do their job. And Sarah was absolutely amazing because she was a, a, a mother, a black woman, and a filmmaker. And she has tried all her life to put all this together and at the same level. She, she, and so that was also important for her, you know, uh, and even in the daily life to assume and in a very racist, country to, to keep going. And so I had uh, her example. So now I feel like, uh, like I have to do it and try on my level to, 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 to preserve her work. And, and of course it's my, uh, like a, a small contribution, but she, her, when she has been working, she had the sense of emergency, which is very important. And she always said, I am not going to wait for someone to make a movie on Césaire or to put it on stage or to talk about uh, colonialism war. She said, we are responsible and we are the one who has to talk our history. Otherwise, nobody will do it. So this, um, uh, uh, sensitivity for emergency uh, was all in all her work and she said now I'm going to find the financial uh, support and I will do it no matter what and she was also that's why uh, I like to say that my mother was a poet overall because she had also uh, um, in, she had integrated the idea of uh, being uh, uh, in advance on her time. Uh, now you may see a lot of uh, uh, great black filmmakers, but she, she was the first one, and she was the first black woman shooting in Africa. Uh, so she has been pioneer in uh, different fields, and, but this idea of it's now, you know, we have to do it. This is our history, and if we want things better for our children, 
we have to, to, to talk about our past, we have to talk about our daily life, and she opens the door, and now it's your, your job to go on. <laughs> Did you ask us about the struggle? Where are we with the struggle? Okay, black people, can we please move beyond the struggle, though? Can we imagine beyond the struggle? Like, I feel like the urgency of now is to imagine beyond the struggle. Um, that's what they want us to be mired in, is the struggle. But I, you know the, uh, the audio from TikTok that's like, darling, I do not dream of labor, you know? Everybody knows that. Um, but I don't dream of struggle. I don't think we do. And I don't think that our legacy should be one of struggle. Um, what stood out to me in one of the films was there was a moment where, um, well, it was a moment that kept coming back uh, about uh, Cesare was saying, somewhere my people dance, you know? Somewhere we are dancing. Like, there are black people dancing right now, somewhere, everywhere. And um, I don't want to bring any disrespect to the struggle. Uh, it's real. We get that. But can we move to the dancing part? Because I don't know if you've ever tried this, but if you want to see who loves you, you just show your joy to people. And if people, like, cringe in the face of it, you don't need those people anywhere near you. Um, so I'm kind of obsessed with what's beyond the struggle. That's kind of where I am right now. So if I understand uh, what you say, that you know, uh, that sharing Sarah's work, also it's part of the joy. It you is say, joy. Yeah. It's yeah. super she, joyful. She, she, she has <laughs> I don't think she would have made, how was it, 48 films? Yeah. If it was struggle that was motivating her. I don't know that. No, no, yeah. no, no but she, she had to, to, to do it. And, and what she wants to say, to, to prove that, uh, you know, you, you can appreciate and she wanted to share and to open the mind and, and to share with also black and African people in Africa. And to say to be proud, also the idea of uh, being proud and to, to tell our histories, that was the thing. Yeah, I got, I got joy from it. That's what I'm saying. Like TLDR, it was giving me joy. It was not giving me struggle. And I think that's why people respond to the work. Because I don't know that we need any more reminders of our struggle. I think we need to remind ourselves of our joy, that it is our birthright, and that these are our stories. And they are full of joy. And they're full of dancing. And they're full of celebrities you know, making cameos in the documentaries, <laughs> you know, like Maya Angelou. That, part that you mentioned with the Everglades all around. Like, it was such a <gasps> moment, you know, in the film. And uh, that's, that's kind of where I want our collective focus to go. If I had a wishing well wish, that's what I'd wish for. Hmm. So, so I have a couple of thoughts about that. One, we gonna fight I, in a parking lot. I can tell what's that. Hmm. <laughs> Was it? It's the way you said, hmm. Black people know. It's on now. We're going to fight. We're going to fight now. Uh, I love it. No, no, because no, I'm thinking through it. I'm thinking through it. Because, you know, I mean, we, we know what the triggers are and the buttons are, right? And so what I, the first, my first, well, my second thought was, you know, I just finished teaching um, this uh, Black Popular Cultures class um, online. And I found myself very frustrated with a few, you know, like small handful of students who no matter what the material was that I, um, I had, you know, I assigned and that they allegedly um, watched or read, the, the, the answer to the whatever question I posed was always like, oh, it was about black people and struggling, right? It was about like the oppression. And I was like, that's not what it was about at all, <laughs> you know? Like that's not, not even close, you know? It was, it was joy or it was, you know, it was, there was, you know, many other things that were going on. And that, so I understand, I think, I mean, maybe I'm not, I don't want to put words into your mouth or misinterpret what you were saying, but the, the, the default, right, to equate blackness with struggle, to equate blackness with oppression, that is, that's a, always, you know, where it is that, that um, we get kind of pigeonholed or sucked into or, you know, that that is who we are. 
Um, I, I, I understand, and I, that's how I heard your comments. Like, I don't want to be consumed by that. It's not that it's not there, but I don't want to be consumed by that. So yes, I am absolutely on board with that. I also, don't, I, but I don't think that it's, I don't want to be reactionary, right? And to go into a place of like, oh, we have to be, you know, it's all about black joy. And what's that? Oh, I talk, I'm from California. I talk fast, sorry. You're doing, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll slow down. Yes, si, si, está bien, está bien, perfecto, disculpa. <laughs> um, so, so right, I don't think it's either or. I think that we have to, to hold all of parts of ourselves, including the struggle, including all of what brought us here today, because without that struggle, we wouldn't be right here sitting in these chairs. So. I think that's... Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I just, well, uh, just to, to, that's why when I started yesterday the, the presentation, I said I don't want Sarah to be presented as a militant cinema, because this is reducing her to the struggles, and I said my mother was, first of all, a poet, and I want her to be remind, reminded as a poet of joy. I love it. I mean, I, I feel you because there are, there are like, there's the camp of struggle, struggle, oppression, pornography, right? And that's, we've been beaten over the head by that for generations. There's also this sort of toxic positivity of like, wee, shuck and jiving black people. It's neither, right? It's neither. Um, but I do find that our common perception socially is that blackness is like a gang you have to be jumped into, that you can't just be living your best life. And I do think that what I was seeing was an artist who got to make work that she loved to make. Um, she was living a life that was rewarding her and she was making important archival work that should be remembered. And that is a celebration, that's great. And I think um, we should avoid the pitfalls of like focusing on struggle. Like it, it goes without saying. We don't, we don't have to sort of constantly revisit the struggle. That I guarantee there's a white person out there who's going to remind us of the struggle. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny because I asked the question because it's, you know, that's Amy Cecil's words in the film is negritude is struggle, and as a poet um, and as a thinker. Um, you know, I don't purport to know what he meant by that, but I think as artists and creators and makers, um, to your point, Andrea, is that we are people of multitudes, and so you can hold struggle and joy together, that often in black struggle, there's still joy, right? Um, it can be very real that you face these systemic issues, but we're still gonna love on ourselves and each other, right? We are still going to make in spite of, right? And it is certainly decentered from whiteness, Right, like we are going to make sure that we're good. Um, it is the archival practice, right? It is the poetry that is written. It is a black woman sitting in the middle of the Everglades, right? Like, like all of those things are true. Um, and so I think, like we we hold those multitudes on the panel, and certainly in the film, I, like I said, am obsessed. So this book is actually all the papers that were published for the conference, and um, Maya Angelou's paper specifically talks about black men in, in movement work um, and, and black patriarchy, like that, that is her paper. You have writers from Brazil, from Costa Rica, um, and, and within the pages you have resistance, you have love, and I think ultimately what we see in Negritude and in the conference is deep love for black people, period. No matter where you are, that the gross human right violation perpetrated by the creators of chattel slavery, the kidnappings and the enslavement of black people, right? Like all of that is what Cicero talks about. And in all of the papers that were submitted, you have all of this love. You know, to be in a room with Alex Haley, with Maya Angelou, with, you know, and I'm from Miami, so watching the film was very special because the choir is from Miami Northwestern High School. Mm. I went to high school at Miami Northwestern. So I was like, that's us. You know, in 87, you have the kids from Liberty City singing at the Negritude Conference. 
And I was just like, wow, like how amazing is that? Um, even watching them on the Metro Rail, it almost seemed kind of futuristic mm -hmm. because in 87, like that's high technology, right? Like we are in the sky, you know? <laughs> and so for me, I'm looking at Afrofuturism, right? Like what it looks like to be on the Metro Rail, reading Amy Césaire, the way I wanna see that as an art installation, <laughs> right? <laughs> like just his words all over the Miami Metro Rail. And so I, I, I think where, what I'm getting to is dreaming and imagination. Um, because I, I see that in the works that were submitted. I see that just even in the creation and the cinematography of how you know, this was pieced together and in the conversations, both very intimate, but also you know, when you think of conference, you don't think intimacy, yet you feel that. Right? Most conferences, I'm like, oh dear God, right? <laughs> but, but like in this case, it mm -hmm. feels so intimate, right? Like, like Alex Haley is talking to me, you know? And, and so I would love to dream a little um, and to talk a little bit about that imagination, black people in the sky reading Amy Césaire and however that comes up, but that, that is very real um, and necessary. I'm so here for it. Let's dream, let's imagine, let's do it. Let's do it, lead us. So in that, um, in that vein, and like, let's, let's ground us in Miami, what does Miami's future look like? What does Miami's black future look like? Let's, let's imagine and dream, what could it be? I'm so goth, oh my God. You said, what does Miami's future look like? And I just heard like sound of like blub, blub, blub underwater. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's climate change. That's the water. That's the water coming for us. I don't, I don't think that's the direction you're going. I just wanted to publicly admit my own morbid sense of humor. Um, so, but please, not where you, you going to the struggle of climate change in the weather center. <laughs> let's imagine that that is not. We're. It, let's take the underwater part okay, out of it. Or maybe city. we're. You know, it's we're, a futuristic city under the water. Okay, mm, it's like Atlantis. Black Atlantis. There you go. Black Lantis. We are people of the water, Agwe, Oshun. Listen, the water is ours. Seriously though, so um, we are uh, in a space and place and time that is very challenging in this state. And um, particularly, I mean, in, in education, uh, when I was thinking about the, the, the Negritu Conference and, um, and also listening to Cesar and, um, and of course, thinking about the centrality of history, right? Uh, in us knowing ourselves and us understanding this moment that we find ourselves in, it, understanding everything, right? And um, the attack against that knowing, right? And the attack against that exposure about, on the part of the state. So I'm, now I'm, I'm, I'm building to a question, right? Because I think I wanna kind of hear from you all in, in, so when I ask the question, well, what does what the future of Miami look like? I'm taking into consideration our present and the attacks that we're facing right now, right, on, um, on knowledge, really, fundamentally, and on um, specifically knowledge about us. Well, and in all of our different components, but in particular, <laughs> like, you know, the um, realities of anti-blackness and oppression that are attempting to be obscured at the moment because they make some people uncomfortable. <laughs> the whole thing of like, oh, we don't want to make certain people uncomfortable in the classroom by teaching these things. Let's it's like, do it. I, yeah, it's like, well, and nobody was trying to, you know, checking for my comfort when I was made to read Huck Finn out loud in a, front, in a class full of white people. That was very uncomfortable as an eighth grader to have to say nigger in front of a bunch of white people, you know? So th it's, so I have lots of feelings about <laughs> this, these laws and legislation and all, you know, all of the, uh, the discourse, right? Um, and I'm wondering about really how do we as you know, artists, educators, you know, creative people, um, intellectuals, I want, I'm, using, I want to, I'm thinking the word confront, I'm also thinking navigate, I'm thinking you know, um, keep alive Césaire's legacy right, in the contemporary moment? Underground, underwater, um, free clinics where women have access to abortions. 
in Miami? I don't know. I mean, you gave us a lot to think about. Like, you gave us a like an imaginary seed to start from, um, but then you planted like three more. But I'm still on like imagine Miami in the future, right? And I'm trying to unimagine it underwater, but I'm struggling, <laughs> you know. So I, I'm already in like okay, so it's an underwater city. Uh, what kinds of things do we have? Do we have free healthcare in this city? Um, free education in this city? Are, are, are women like human beings in this city? Do black people get to be human beings in this city? Because these are things we're still trying to get like in the country, you know? And Miami is in Florida, as I've heard. It is, they lie. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to circle back to the fashions in the 1987 uh, Negritude Con. Like, were you all there for the fashions though? Because as a child of the 80s, I was so here for the fashions, black people in the fashions. It was just so wonderful to see us being glorious and beautiful. Um, I've been walking around this conference just like, oh my God, there's black people here. They have black people in Miami, because I live in Seattle. So I would hope that um, the Miami of the future would be its original black ass self, you know? Anushka, dreaming and imagining. <laughs> a Miami of the future, oh, yeah. or a space of the future, what does that look like for you? Um, well, um, I, uh, I can imagine to have a, a library and uh, all the archives of Sarah and the films available, and I hope that uh, a lot of uh, young uh, filmmakers will keep going and make what, whatever film they want. I, because, you know, when Sarah started learning cinema and then trying to make films, they said, why a black woman? Who, who, why, why, do, why do she think that she's able? And so now uh, there is no more frontier, uh, or less, or different frontiers. And so and I'm dreaming that you will be here or just because who you are and not just because of your color of skin and, you know, I hope that without forgetting where, from where we are, but mm. trying to be much more all together and the imagination will be for our children to, to grow and uh, be able to just uh, approve joy and life and poetry and, uh, you know, the, the, the universe belongs to them. No, it, uh, I, have, I have a gift for you, but it will be for the end. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I think this will be the last question I asked the panel because we're going to open it up to questions to you all. Um, but, you know, and, and going back to your mom, Anushka, I think we end on preservation, right? Like, you know, we talk about telling our stories, we talk about creating unapologetically and dreaming, um, but the archives are so important and archives are very political. They are not neutral. Um, and so like whose work gets saved? Whose work that can part. you find, right? And, and so I would love you know, to hear from you all on, and, and especially you, Dr. Quili, especially when we talk about education realm, right? And in the spaces that you're in, uh, like how you're thinking about preserving. I like to ask black people, uh, how do you want to be remembered as an ancestor? Because we're future ancestors right now. And, you know, it's like we've gone full circle in my mind. Because I really started off thinking, like, how are we going to caretake, how are we going to curate and caretake our voices um, so that they continue, so that we continue? Um, but I really think, in just a really logistic way, we need to do more of the work that you're doing. Um, we need to make sure we're canonizing ourselves, that we're getting into the archives. You know, if there are, you know, black folks with means out there, you need to be putting money behind work, like the work that you're doing, so that it, so that it isn't a struggle, <laughs> so that it's a joy, you know, that you just open your inbox and it's a bunch of people trying to pay you to do exactly what you're doing. And I really loved when you said, imagine a world where filmmakers get to make whatever they want, that part, you know, where you're not writing to a grant or to a government, 
but just because you need money. Making films is extremely expensive. Um, having the social and community support behind that work and that investment, that, that would be lovely. Absolutely. Um, so I'm thinking about the project that I'm working on now, which is an edited volume on the work of Gloria Rolando, the filmmaker, Cuban black um, Cuban filmmaker, um, who has been in the struggle. <laughs> I mean, in terms of making her films, making her work in a, in a very, oh, slow down, sorry, that's right. Um, making films in a, under very difficult circumstances and dedicating her life um, and her work and her creative energy and vision to preserving our stories, our Caribbean stories, our black Cuban stories, our um, you know, African diasporic stories. And so I think that <clears throat> the work of recognizing, honoring, preserving individual filmmakers, trying to raise money, you know, she's actually working on a film now on the um, order of black nuns that were in Cuba, they were in New Orleans, they were in I think another, a few other cities throughout. Um, and so we know there are all of these stories, right? And so we each have, I think, a responsibility to do, I mean, you know, what you're doing is like these amazing, you know, you know, again, preserving the legacy of your mother and it's a, it's a labor of love as, you know, as well as, as you said, keeping her, her memory alive and keeping her close to you. And so I think that we all, can do that. You, that's what you're doing in your work, right? When you're in the archives and you're bringing out those stories and you're, you know, have this public voice that, I mean, she's amazing. <laughs> um, and, and that is really, I think that's what we're in our own way carrying on Cesar's legacy, carrying on the legacy of negritude, um, you know, making sure that, that our voices are heard and we're the ones who are curating them, right? But I would like to add something about uh, the archives of my mother. The archives are, you know, the films, uh, the, the materials so that I'm trying to, 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 to gather. For now, I, I am looking, still looking for five movies, so I have nothing on them. And I know some are in Algeria. I found that one is in Panama, so uh, I have to go there. And uh, others are completely lost. But I have also screenplays, documents, letters, huge um, uh, papers uh, and uh, letters that she wrote to and received from uh, Leopold Cedar Senghor, letters from uh, to uh, Aimé Césaire. I have all this stuff, which is and photographs, so it's, I don't know how many boxes are organized at home. But I wanted to add that uh, when I start uh, working on the archived, I contacted the French uh, 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 National Library saying, because my mother was French, and said, look, I have all this stuff. Are you interested? Because my sister Enda and I are sure that our mother, it's our intimacy. But she was also a filmmaker, and this part belongs to the public. And we would like to share it to the public to have the movies available in all film festivals, and also people who, for example, would like to read a screenplay or to read all the projects she had that she could not make. For example, so I, I contacted the uh, uh, French uh, National Library and they said, I have all of that, all of these documents. Are you interested? They said, oh, no. So now we are uh, hoping to bring all this stuff to United States. And we are in contact with the university and I hope they will uh, take it, and then it will be available for you. And for the world, for, uh, which means anyone who would like to, to have access, because that's in the statement, it will be in a place, but open to the public, to any researcher, or to any person who just would like to see the movies, or read the screenplay, and have an idea of the documents we have. Yes, going where we are valued. So we have <laughs> you know, like where are you valued? Where you know, as opposed to knocking on the closed door, 
<laughs> and, and banging up and like beating our souls up on a closed door. Turn around, there's an open door right there and they have a party in there and they actually care about what you're doing and value you, so. All right, it's your turn, guys. Questions? Um, first of all, thank you all for your work and what you're doing, uh, and especially just pre preserving and archiving um, your mother's history. Um, and I commend you on that work because I, as well as archivists, know just like the time that it, it consumes. Um, but I guess the question of the day would be, uh, what is your favorite form of documentation for yourself? So do you like to journal or do you not like to take photos um, or do you I, like? I, I, I do not understand the question. She said, what is your favorite form of documentation for yourself? So journaling, taking pictures, like how are you recording your life? How are you recording your life? My life. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's not interesting. <laughs> I, uh, not at all, uh, no, not at all. But um, as I understand that uh, my life was, uh, is not uh, casual, so someday I will write a, a, a book for my daughter to tell her how, uh, how were her grandparents and how I grew up in this can, you know, with uh, Cabral and, uh, you know, and telling stories. But, but I, for, I think for now it's not inter int very interesting, and, but I will do it when I will have time. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I loved your question because when you asked it, um, something inside of me went, eep, you know, like it was a, like it was a scary question, uh, which makes it a good question. Um, I mean, how are we going to staple ourselves down on the history clipboard? You know, like how, how are we doing that? I, I think there's like the real way that you do it and then the imaginary way that you do it. You know when you go to the grocery store and you buy food because you think that you're the person who eats food like that and then you get to your house and you order Uber Eats because that's not actually who you are? You know, I think it's like that. So like the imaginary me would really like to remember myself through the good work that I'm doing, like the way your mother just made good work. And so it lives beyond her because it, it does. Um, I think real me takes selfies, lots of, uh, I love audio actually. Like I'm the friend in the group that will turn on the voice recorder when we're like sitting by the ocean and you can hear the ocean and the, the birds and our conversations. I, I think audio is really powerful. I, as someone who loves history and is always digging in archives, I print out my photos still because in this digital world, um, you know, not to get all macabre, but estate planning is real. Like what happens when you're no longer here and we lose so much because so much of our lives are online. And if your family members don't have the passwords or if it's not explicitly written in your will, then they don't get it. They'll close down your social media, but they won't get access to your Instagram. They won't have access to your Facebook. There's a whole thing on estate planning for digital assets that you should look up. Um, I am not an attorney, but, <laughs> but that is real, right? Like actually planning for those things. And so if much of your world is digital, like how are you archiving your digital world or allowing someone else outside of you to have access to that space? Because if not, and no one knows where to find it, your cloud, your whatever, then you lose a lot, I think, especially now in this digital world in a way that it's not like, when my father passed away, I was in high school, but like I still have his driver's license, you know, I have like little things that he had. Um, but we're not very tactile and physical in that way because so many things are digital. So I think a lot, uh, I fear a lot will be lost if we don't figure out a way to also come into the, the tactile world. So I print out my photos, I write notes on the back of them. We were here on this date, so my kids will see it. Um, and I journal. 
God bless my children if they read those journals at some point, but I journal. <laughs> um, <laughs> ooh, there's some things in there. Um, but, but I do still write things down, right? Uh, but I know folks who have digital diaries or they keep it in their notes app, and it's like, does anyone have that password? You know, so like you have like a whole book probably, but that book may be gone if, you know, because of digital access, because of changing technology and all of that stuff. So I definitely think, you know, there is a lot of space to talk about digital archiving and being conscious and intentional around like what that means for individuals and organizations. I do also love that question and I hadn't, but my best friend and I actually just changed, exchanged um, passwords. So that's a good thing. Somebody out there in the world has my password in case I get hit by a bus. But um, I don't know. That's such a good question. Um, and it's hard because we're so, I mean, for me, I'm just kind of in my life and I'm not thinking about recording it and I'm not um, a fan of social media. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, you know, I, 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 I'm, I don't take pictures of meals and things. So um, <laughs> I'm not sure. I just, I guess maybe it is the work that I do and that'll, that I'm leaving behind. Maybe that's something we can dream together. <laughs> maybe that's in the imaginary Miami. I have an Instagram account. <laughs> um, any other questions? Hi, how you doing? Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I, I really I'm sorry, can you introduce yourselves when you speak? I just like to know oh, random yes. people's Hello. names. Though I'm you're Juan. not random to me, but you know. <laughs> I'm Juan, uh, I'm a filmmaker and also a part of the Third Horizon team. Um, I, I, I think it's... I need to say something. Juan was the person who really pushed for uh, this to happen, so right. yes. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. <laughs> But it's it's because I saw your post uh, about the, the Nigger Two Conference, <laughs> and I thought it was so fascinating. And I was like, this needs to we need to keep talking about this. Um, but I, I was really thinking about what what you just mentioned about the th these films and these archives being publicly accessible and and where it will live. Uh, and it's it's really beautiful for it to go to uh, you know either you know a state library or a university. But I also think about how we can build our own. I don't even want to call them institutions, but like platforms. Um, and if all of you who are, who are here, like thinking about the ways that we can actually build radical institutions or platforms for our futures that we have real control of, because there's a good reason to not have faith in other institutions. Um, and, you know, are those spaces meant to be sustainable? You know, can we really grow and not become corrupted? Or, you know, how, how are you all thinking about you know, uh, holding, uh, creating our own spaces and, and having that survive or, or not. <laughs> you got us thinking, obviously. It's not that it's like a bad question. We're just, we're thinking, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the Schomburg Center is a perfect example, right? Uh, in New York, and I mean, it is part of the New York Public Library system, but Arturo Schomburg, like the largest holder of like black text and ephemera in the US was able to build a library that then became part of a publicly accessible library system. Libraries can be some very radical spaces. I love the library, I love librarians. Shout out to the Miami Day Public Library System who raised me. Um, it is why I am a perfect nerd, is because my librarian was Miss Shanita acrylic nails, Janet Jackson braids, and uh, Little River, and it's my friend still today. Um, but I really think libraries, like, because I, I think like the spaces we create and also spaces that you can work with in allyship. Um, and I think as a public facing space, I think libraries are really powerful places, um, not academic libraries, those places aren't fun, um, but like library systems. Because one thing about library people, there's no cut in the library budget. Like play if you want to, but if you go to a Miami-Dade budget meeting in the fall, 
and they start talking about taking money from the library, it's like, cuckoo, like the library people just come and they're like, hold up, <laughs> right? People don't play with library people. Like, because you're talking about parents, you're talking about the elderly, like the access space. So I think libraries can be a really interesting space um, that and don't get used as much as they can be. And librarians love to share their their, their expertise. Um, and so I, I think a lot about, like as I do the Black Miami Day project and the things that I make, I'm like, where does that live? Like, you know, eventually, and I'm like, maybe the library. Um, but also, I mean, there is a case you made about creating your own platforms, but we also know that comes with funding. And then you gotta do the funding game, which, you know, is those major funders who are disproportionately, go, you know, that systemic fight, right? So, um, so how do you radicalize philanthropy so that you know you can actually be sustainably funded and not just funded in crisis mode because they killed a black person? Low budget, <laughs> low budget as opposed to big budget. I think we just need to be much more concerted in our efforts to make circles where we can um, have what Cesare said was a, like a taste of ourselves. Um, storytelling is pretty ancient, it's not broken, it still works. Um, we need to be able to sit in circles um, at dinner tables and um, in parks and gather and smile and laugh and listen and really listen to each other like we are living treasures. Like, I, I can't get over the fact that I get to be with you all right now, you know? Like, this is so exciting. Um, I think we need more of that. And it's been a rough, you know, pandemic Lovato. It's been difficult to not be with each other, you know? So I think we need to make that extra effort to reconnect and listen. I'm just smelling my library that I grew up in. <laughs> That's where I am. One more question for Jason Fitzroy Jeffries. Is his middle name really Fitzroy? His middle name really is Fitzroy. That was just a question. That is Jason Fitzroy Jeffries. Doesn't he sound like a monarchy or something unto That's himself? <laughs> so Caribbean. <laughs> She does not stop, my God. Any questions? <laughs> Y'all better ask a question. Or a comment about the film? A reflection? All right, go home can I then. Can I be like a, like a woo-woo artsy person myself, basically? Do you mind at the back, like literally everybody just saying your name and who you bring, living or dead, into this space with you? If we go quickly, I think everyone will be able to speak. Is that okay? It's okay because I'm doing it. Mr. So, Fitzroy Jeffers? Um, someone at the back kick it off and just literally, you know, just pass hate, the mic to someone. I hate to say I don't, we don't have enough time. <laughs> Why? We, okay, we see, this, time, this yeah. is, we, we need to radically upend things like <laughs> temporal <laughs> boundaries. Anushka, are you, are you gonna okay. Anushka has a gift for us, so pause. Oh, yes. um, so I think Anushka is gonna close us out then, but. No, but if, if there is no more question, <laughs> is, is that okay? Yes, absolutely. Give us our, your gift. Uh, this is not this, okay. Uh, um, has a gift uh, or, or for, uh, I thought for to, to yeah, an offering just to, to, to close. Um, I just wanted to read some words from Aimé Césaire and I wanted to read the poem that Maya Angelou is telling in the, in the film, but I will, I will read it in French. J'habite une blessure sacrée. J'habite un voyage de mille ans, j'habite. Une guerre de 300 ans. J'habite un culte désaffecté entre bulbes et cailleux. J'habite l'espace inexploité. 
j'habite du basalte. Non, une coulée, mais de la lave, le mascaré qui remonte la vailleuse à toute allure et brûle toutes les mosquées. Je m'accommode de mon mieux de cet avatar d'une version du paradis absurdement raté. C'est bien pire qu'un enfer. J'habite de temps en temps une de mes plaies. Chaque minute, je change d'appartement et toute paix m'effraie. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, I am so very, very honored that you all joined us today. It, it, this was a gift, right? I just feel as if this whole weekend has been an incredible gift, and I'm, I'm gift, and I'm just so, you know, grateful to everybody. Um, we do have uh, some more films um, from Sarah Maldor coming up, um, both today and uh, tomorrow as well. Um, you, you have to stick around. Um, you know, again, for, the, for these next few films, um, Sarah Maldor's Artist Portraits, but then also you cannot miss our closing night film, um, her masterpiece, Sambizanga. Like, that is, it's, um, I can't say, I can't possibly say enough about it. Um, but thank you all for joining us. Um, Nadej, thank you so much. Nadej Green, follow her on Instagram, Black Miami Date, um, one of my favorite accounts. Always such an education. Natasha Marin, thank you so much. Dr. Amanda Quilly, thank you so much. And Anushka de Andrade, thank you so much. So we're going to take a quick five minute break and then we're going to watch um, of the last set of um, uh, Maldor films that we'll be showing here at PAM, a few more shorts. Then we're heading back over to the Little Haiti Cultural Complex. There is a, a lecture this afternoon, which is, I, I don't know if you've heard of um, Olivier Mabouf's um, Toward a Deep Speaking Cinema. It's an essay that was recently written that has been making waves in the Caribbean film world. Um, it's, it's a manifesto and call to action in many ways. And we are so grateful that he is joining us to actually uh, deliver this in person. Um, it is much like um, Anushka joining us. It is, it is one of our favorite pieces of programming that we've put together thus far. So we hope you'll stick around. And, 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 and then tonight we're dancing. So you can't miss that either. Right. Well, you See you soon. <laughs>